Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. How are you? I am delighted to be here. I think this is my third time. And they said third time is a charm. <laughs> but I am so delighted uh, to be here. Thank you, Pastor JP, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here with you. And uh, gosh, uh, worshiping in God's house. I am a Vietnamese, um, born, raised in Vietnam. I'm the 12th child in the family. But whenever I go to church, either I teach in Turkey or I go back to Vietnam in 11 days to teach at Hanoi Bible College or my own church in uh, San Jose or here. When I, whenever I enter into God's house, I feel like home. So I hope you don't mind. I feel like home here too. So it's a delight for me to be here. Um, let us bow our heads and ask God to teach us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the worship team, for the opportunity to praise you. And at this time, we are submitting to your care and to your teaching. Holy Spirit, you are the speaker, the teacher. Comfort us, encourage us, challenge us, and edify us with your truth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we will study God's Word in Luke Chapter 11, as Pastor JP uh, alerted me, we, uh, the church here, uh, the family of God here is in a series of parables of Jesus. So I um, want to invite you to think of a very special parable in Luke. Uh, it is called the parable of the friend at midnight. Do we have it on the screen, the PowerPoint? Well, parables are famous teachings, tools of Jesus. Each parable, each parable contains a story, an imagery, a picture, or a metaphor to teach us something about God's truth. I think most of us read or know this parable already. And by and large, this parable speaks of prayer the power, the patience, or the persistence of praying to God. But this morning, I want to invite you to consider another aspect of this parable. I think it is not only prayer, but this parable, when you look at it, it's more than prayer. It is about our relationship with God. And I begin with Luke and the first slide, the second slide, next slide, please. And Jesus was talking to the crowd and his disciples. And he was saying, there's a, the, sto the, the story goes like this. Uh, there's a friend who uh, came into the host house. Friend, uh, th th there's someone uh, visiting his house and he, has to, he doesn't have food, right? Uh, as you know the story already. He doesn't have food at home, and he has to go to his friend, his neighbor friend, to ask for food. And the story goes like this. Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Next slide says, the friend inside says, don't bother me. The door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed. It's too late. I can't get up and give you anything. So you have the story of someone who is knocking on the door of his friend to ask for help at night because someone is visiting him. You know, maybe in this time, of our time is different, but during ancient time, next slide will tell you, 
if you have someone come into your house in the middle of the night and want to stay with you, in the biblical times, in ancient times, hospitality is very, very important. In the ancient Middle East, if someone comes to your house, you usually wash the guest's feet. Why? Because there's a lot of dust when you walk in, on the street in Jerusalem, in Palestine. And when, when your guest comes, you take off the sandal, you wash him, her, with the, feet, with, the, with the towel, with water. You have to give them something to eat, a place to stay. So hospitality is very, very important in the Middle East. Now, probably the guest is very hungry. And you have nothing else. You have nothing in your home. And it's late at night. What do you do? Well, you go to your friend's house. And you knock on his door. Can I have three loaves of bread so I can feed my host, my guests at home? Next slide, please. The story goes like this. God is more than the sleeping friend who reluctantly gives in to requests at midnight. And we will move to the story and we will hear about this. The story is not about a friend, not about a father either, but the story is about God who is more than a friend, more than a parent. Next slide says, the Father, our God, the Father, is more attentive and responsive to the needs of us as His children. God is more than a guest, more than a parent, more than a human relationship. And Jesus continues with next slide. And of course, this is about prayer. Ask, and it will be given into, unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus is opening his heart to his disciples, to the people who come to him. We come to God when we pray, not as a friend, more than a friend. We come to God as a father who is much more intimate, who is much more close, who knows us. And God invites us to pray with him and to intimately commune with him as the father to a child. And let's continue with the next slide. Jesus gives a comparison here. Which of you fathers or mothers, earthly parents, if your son or daughter asks you for bread, will you give him a stone? This is Jesus' rhetorical question to, to his disciples. If you are a parent, a dad or a mom, if your child comes to you, asks for bread, which is a good thing, right? Will you give him a stone? Of course not. If he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? Of course not. If he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? Apparently not. Because if your children ask you for a good thing, you wouldn't give him an evil thing, right? And this is Jesus' way of explaining how children ask us for the small things. Parents were able to give good things. Next slide. Well, first of all, let me be clear. This is not my car but I'm the one who's sitting on the car. Well, I have three children, 
Uh, Catherine is in uh, Malibu right now working for a medical clinic. But we bought her a Kia uh, several years ago. It was gray and dark. It's a used uh, Kia. Well, my daughter has a preference for pink color. When we, when, uh, we were in Chicago, we bought a house, and she says, Dad, I want my room to be pink. So we paint the whole room in what I call Pepto-Bismol color. She wants her room pink. So here, we bought her a Kia, a gray Kia. She paid her friend 600 bucks to put on pink sheets. Well, as a dad, every time she comes home, I take care of all of her car needs. Oil, maintenance, tune up. But the thing I dread is drive the car to Costco and get gas for her. So every time Catherine comes home, I take care of all her car needs. Then I would drive to Costco on Hostetter right here. And then when I step out of the car, some people say, bro, is that your car? I said, of course not. This is my daughter's car. But the moral of the story is, as a dad who is imperfect, sinful, and ordinary in many ways, as an earthly dad knows how to give good things to his children, how much more God, as your heavenly dad, give you, care for you, provide for you, and meet you from the desires of your heart. What is Jesus doing here in this parable? It's not just only prayer, but it is about relationships. Of all the human relationships, a friend at midnight a guest coming to your house, a parent, of all the earthly relationships, the relationship that grounded you the most is your relationship to the Heavenly Father. Your relationship with God grounds all the other relationships. Let's move on to the next slide. In the Greek terminology, we call God Abba, our Heavenly Father. If you survey all the religions in the world, I grew up in the Buddhist world in Vietnam for many years. We don't call God our dad. There is no other faith community that address God, his Father. But the God of the Bible is so bold, so intimate, so loving, that the relationship we have with him, we are his children, and he is our dad. The next slide. The Jews refer to God as the father of the nation. If you go to the Old Testament, They don't call God our my father, but God is the father of Abraham, the father of Isaac, the God of Jacob, usually the father of a country, the father of a nation. But when Jesus appears on the scene, he reveals, or he unveils the relationship between God and us in a closer way. An Old Testament, uh, a New Testament scholar says this, the experience of God as Father dominates the whole ministry of Jesus from baptism to the crucifixion. When Jesus tells us about his Father, I will ask the Father to give you. When I go to the Father, 
He will prepare a place for you. My Father and I are one. The whole ministry of Jesus, His relationship is between Him and the Father. And Jesus is the one introduced to us. God is our Father. So the relationship between you and God is fundamental, crucial for how you operate in life, for your identity. Next slide says in Hosea. This is one of my favorite Bible verses in the Old Testament. God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Oh my goodness. It's not only a country, but God loves his people. When they was, when, when, when Israel was suffering in Egypt, God already set his eyes on his people. They're his children. Out of Egypt I called my son. The way God sees his people is children. We're not strangers. We're not enemies. But the relationship between us and God is father and son and daughter. Brothers and sisters. I call you brothers and sisters in the community of faith because we have the same father. Our relationship grounds us with God and to one another. I go to, I went to uh, Turkey twice last year to uh, give training to missionaries and pastors who minister to the Muslim community. And I worship in the Church of Turkey, the whole service was in Turkish language. I had no idea what I was listening to. But I felt at home worshiping with them. In 10 days, I'll be leaving for Vietnam, teaching for 49 students in Hanoi Bible College in the north. I will worship with them, and, then, and I will study the Word of God with them, and they are my brothers and sisters. But our relationship with God grounds all other relationships. Next slide. Imagine, this is incredible. There is no other religion or faith like it. God, the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the same God, is the mighty, sovereign God of the universe. God created the world. God created you and I. He, he runs the world. He created the world. He's the judge of all things, present, past, and future. Yet, this same God is your Father. My Father. Imagine that. We pray. We talk. We walk. We serve. When we come and we ask, we don't ask a stranger, but we ask God, my Father. Next slide. Jesus teases this idea out. If you then, though are evil, if you heavenly fathers and mothers, evil here is not sinister or wickedness. Evil here is you are sinners. Parents, you are imperfect people. You are sinners. You make mistakes. If you are imperfect people, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If I am an imperfect dad in many ways, knows how to love my daughter and take good care of her car, risk of being embarrassed driving in a pink car, know how to do good things for my daughter, how much more 
God our Father will be good to us and give good to us. Next slide. The emphasis of the message here is how much more? If your father and mother on earth provided so much for you, love you, care for you, nurture you, teach you, how much more your father in heaven will take care of you. Our parents take care of us here in this earthly world. But our heavenly Father will take care of us into eternity. Let's look at the next slide. So what is Jesus doing in this passage? He began with a friend. Even a friend who is sleeping at night. But if you knock enough, he gets annoyed enough, he's going to give, give in to you anyway, right? Okay, oh, get out of here. I'll give you the bread. Your earthly father and mother is more important, more giving than the friend. They're more sacrificing. How much more? If your friend is good, if your earthly parent is so, so good, how much more than God is to us? This parable is not only prayer. I think it's deeper than prayer. It is about the love of God to his children. Amen? Amen? Next slide, please. God's heart is more gracious and caring than any human neighbor to his friend or any human father, mother to their children. So this is about the relationship between God and us compared to the relationship between people and people. So the fundamental relationship that grounds you is between you and God. If you are at peace with God, you will have the energy, the love, the wisdom to have a relationship with other people. Next slide, please. That's my mom and dad and me. That was 1981 in Hong Kong refugee camp. I don't know what happened to me. I used to look better, but anyway, that's another story. That's mom and dad. I'm the 12th kid in the family. Uh, my daughter went to Pepperdine University, so she slid the picture of the Vietnamese stories in the magazine there. But dad was a mayor in Vietnam. He owned a fish sauce company. We owned four homes. Family had 12 children. After the fall of Saigon in 1975, we lost it all. The fish sauce company, three biggest homes. And we lived the smallest homes. We lost our country. My dad was arrested into the communist concentration camp. He was in there for six years and six months until he escaped out of the prison and escaped into a boat with me and my mom and my sister. And the story I told you, we nearly died in the ocean. But dad and mom are very dear to us. If your earthly parent is so dear, so good to you, him, how much more your heavenly father will be good to you. 
to you. I remember mom and dad came here in Santa Clara. And then I went to UC Davis for college. I would come home once a month because I miss pho and rice and fish and Vietnamese food. Dad came here when he was almost 60. He retired. We had no money. I came home from college every month. I knew my parents had no money. I never asked them for money. And my parents had no money, so they don't have money to give me. So mutually, we know each other. So don't ask about money. But I never forget this. Every time I come home from college, mom and dad would say, Kim, go to the backyard. You will find many bags of bottles and cans. Those bottles and cans, dad and mom walk in the morning, exercise in the morning, and then they would carry a bag during their morning walk, and then they would collect bottles of can and plastic, and they would save it for me, and they put it in the backyard. When I come home from college, go back there, take all those, go to the recycling center, and the money is yours. Every time I would get about $30 and $40, I know how much my mother and father loved me with all they got. When I went to seminary in uh, Chicago for my master's and PhD program there, I sold all my stocks at Hewlett Packard and biopharmaceutical companies here to uh, attend seminary. It was expensive. And I had no more money. I had to use credit card to pay for my fees and my living. I never asked my mom and dad for money. But dad and mom know I need it. And then one summer, I had no money left. We had three children. I opened the mail. There was an envelope from my dad and mom. For the first time ever, I don't know about you guys, but Asian dads, in the, you know, the previous generations, we don't touch our children, we don't say I love you. None of that. <laughs> they love us in a different way. But I remember that summer in Chicago, Illinois, I opened that envelope for the first time ever I see a letter. My dad says, Kim, I love you. You know how much that means to me? For the first time ever, 40-year-old kid, that I hear that my dad says he loves me. And with a check of $10,000. I don't know where they get that money. They have, must have saved it for years. And it's the time then when God knows and they know, I need you. Why am I bringing this issue up? If your earthly mother and earthly father, they are imperfect, sinful human beings, I'm a dad myself, and I know that well. If we are parents in this earth, we know how to be good 
how to do good, to give good to our children. How much more? Your heavenly Father knows what to give back to you. Amen? Next slide. If you can summarize the whole New Testament, you would realize that God loves you as a heavenly father. There are three things. God loves us so much by sending his son to us. The greatest gift is not money. It's sending someone to us. It's his own son. He has the greatest gift to give us is the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved us that he gave his son. If you and I ever doubt that God loved it's not enough for us. I invite you to look at the cross of Jesus Christ. If you ever think that God abandons you or God do not care or God is not there, please give God a chance. Look at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. There you will find the love of God. Secondly, God gave us his son, but God accepts us as his children. God makes us his son and his daughters. See what kind of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. That's your identity. You are a child of God. You know, in the Bay Area... How do people identify you? Oh, Mr. Kim, hi, after the pleasantries and exchange, what do you do? Where do you live? What type of work do you do? Our identity is judged by performance. Wealth, education, countries of origin, whatever you name it. But in God, those are secondary. Your identity is you are a beloved child of God. The third time, the third way that God loves us is by discipling, disciplining us as his children. Hebrews says, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Sometimes God does not give all that we want. Maybe that's a good thing. God gives what we need. But sometimes God gives us lessons. There are lessons that are painful. But that's what we need. I remember when, uh, my bad, I used to skip school in Vietnam. I love to go to the Buddhist temple and uh, climb on the coconut trees and you know, do my own thing with my friends. I would come home and I got... You know, the Buddhist monk knows I'm the child, Mr. Lee. And he, you know, he would tell me. And my dad would scold me. And then he would make me lie down. But I know, I wear three pants. It didn't hurt. But I remember my dad scolding me. He would drink green tea. And he would say, this time you skip school, you have 10 rods from me. 
But the next time you skip school, 10 multiplied by 2 equals 20. And the next time it will be 40 and then 80. But the thing is, I wear three pants. I can handle the pain, the physical pain. It's okay. But the most painful thing is my dad would drink tea. And he, he would spend 15 minutes lecturing me how bad it is to climb on the Buddhist temple coconut tree. And that 15 minutes of torture was like eternity. Gosh, I hate those lessons. But you know what? Looking back, if my dad didn't do that, I would do worse things. Much, much worse. Those lessons taught me to behave. When I entered UC Davis, the very first semester, 1988, in the chemistry building, 500 students. First year in college, full of temptations. There was a guy next to me. He took his backpack out very stealthily, and there was a white bag with powder. And he says, hey man, first one's on me for free. You guess you know what it is, right? I thought about my dad. I thought about my dad. If I take that pouch for free, the next one is going to cost me money. Not only money, it's going to cost me much more. Sometimes, this is for young folks. I was one time a young guy too. We don't like it when our parents discipline us. But no, they love us. They love us so much. They don't want us to do bad even though it's uncomfortable being disciplined, trust me, it's going to be good for you. The Lord does things to his children the same way. Sometimes God gives us painful lessons, but it is to make us wiser and stronger and to stay away from evil. Last light. I know this passage is about prayer. But today I invite you to think this passage is about relationship between you and God. God loves us as a father. And his love will never fail. Whatever you go through right now, whatever doubt you have about God, just remember this, please. My friend and I translated a book uh, from English into Vietnamese. It's about 550 pages. It's going to be published in Vietnam when I um, go back in 10 days. There's a verse that I cannot translate into Vietnamese. I just cannot. There are some words in the original language you cannot do justice translate into Vietnamese. And this is the verse. As a translator, I'm just, I don't know how. Maybe you can help me translate into Vietnamese better. The phrase goes like this. The love of God will never let me go. The love of God will never let me go. I don't know how you translate it into Indian or other language. I cannot do justice into Vietnamese. I'll just stick it like that. Sometimes we have to experience the love of God so profoundly. 
Even the English language cannot describe it. Or the Vietnamese or any language. The love of God is just beyond words. He's not going to let you down. I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us through this passage. Would you please stand?